You've been charged for staying dedicated to the grind. You have the right to remain silent and keep the hustle to yourself or help others with the game. State your name for the record. Yo, what's cracking, man? I go by OG Rome, a.k.a. Mr. Everywhere, ripping Road Dogs Entertainment, man. Now, where do you get that name from? Yo, growing up in the streets, man. Shit, I was uh, actually in foster homes, so I found myself uh, just roaming around city to city, but I wanted to spell it different, and I found myself... You know, idolizing Rome for the kings and, and, the, and the history that they had. So I'm like, let me stick to Rome before you know it. There was already an artist named Rome. So I'm like, you know what I'm saying? I'm from the streets. So the homies called me OG. So I'm like, fuck it, OG Rome. And just kept riding with it. And before you know it, you know, had my own URL. So I ain't got to fight over anybody taking my motherfucking name. You feel me? Yeah, yeah. So how did uh, Mr. Everywhere come about, man? Damn, that's some real shit, man. That was a uh, industry nickname. I found myself... Being on the outside in, always trying to, you know, uh, put myself in a position to win and be noticed by the rest of the legendary artists. So I found myself uh, just going to all the events going and supporting everybody and going to events on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And before you know it, all these legendary people found me at the place to be. It had corrupts and all these people. And before they know it, they started calling me, hey. You're everywhere, right? You missed it everywhere. And then little by little, just hearing them say it, I'm like, fuck it, man. Them motherfuckers just gave me a nickname. I'm going to run with it. Got that shit tatted, missed it everywhere. And that shit, it just hashtagged it and, you know, it became my shit. You feel me? Uh, uh, it's official, too, because you be everywhere, man. I, I'm real <laughs> shit. Because I follow you and I'm a fan, man. Likewise, and I was like, bro. man, this man is really fucking everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be, man. So where's, where's your hometown from, man? Uh, Inglewood, California, man. Inglewood, California. Now, how old, what high school you go to? I went to Morningside High School, man. Morningside. So why you never decided to be a Pyro, man? No, no. And actually, that was the uh, 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 the bottoms. That was the bloods. The bloods and the yeah. bottoms. You know what I'm saying? I had a lot of homies out there. Matter of fact, we were used to be uh, selling weed. We used to jump on 104 in the bottoms. We used to jump the gate, jack uh, uh, bottles from Food for Less, and come back and sell it to the bloods. And then they'd be all fucking fucked up, find each other, and we would just all high as fuck. But that was back in the days, man. So, you know? um, back in the um, high school days, man, did y'all ever have to deal with the black and brown riots and shit like Actually, that? Actually, that's funny, though, because almost, I find myself, like, almost every high school or everybody at a point in time has the Mexican and black riots. But the crazy thing about me is that I always had black friends. I grew up in, in foster homes, so I always had black friends. And in high school, I always played uh, high school football sports. So I already had the advantage of getting along with everybody. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I was most popular and everything. So I never had to deal with having to fight with anybody that was black. Everybody that was black and that knew me, they knew I played football. So you ain't going to fuck with me, period. <laughs> you yeah, know? you got to pass. Yeah. So when was you introduced to music? Music, just obviously back in the 90s, growing up, just listening to the old school gangster rap. As a Mexican, all my family got the low riders. We selling dope, you know what I'm saying? So we bumping nothing but that cocaine and WA, nothing but that dope shit. And then... Uh, Back in high school, I find myself selling and selling dope, selling weed, and freestyling. That's when Eminem came out. And when Eminem came out, it just felt like now anybody from different uh, backgrounds has a little bit of opportunity to get a, a chance in the industry. So I started following Eminem, started learning about rap and, and freestyling. So if you want to learn, you have to go way back, start digging into the yeah. hip-hop history and everything. And before you know it... From freestyling, I just started recording and, and just moving forward, man. Yo, yo, man. So um, and by your artist name, you go by OG Rome, right? OG Rome, yeah. And where could they find some of your music at? Everywhere on um, social media is OG Rome 310. All the uh, platforms for music is OG Rome 310. Or you guys can visit my um, personal website at www.roadogs.com. So being an Hispanic, man, and being an artist, I know you had your share of black women. Mm -hmm. Now, you raising a daughter, if you had a daughter, I don't know if you have a daughter. I got no kids. No bro. kids yet, but if you had a daughter, would you approve of her dating a black man? The truth about it is you got to judge a person by their character. Me, living in foster homes with black people, Asian people, white people, I was able to see a different perspective of life, and not everybody has that. You could assume and you could be from the outside saying, okay, I'm going to allow it, but unless you hang out with that culture and know them, then you're going to realize that we're all really just human, you know? I work around a lot of races. I work with a lot of people like that. So me, I'm more accepting of the situation. Other people, they grow up with their parents telling them, 
hey, you can't do this, you can't do that. And, and, and growing up with their cultural ways. And we're Mexican American, so out here, man, no matter what color you are, man, as long as you guys vibe, you guys get along, then it's all good. You feel me? That's for sure, man. Um, so let's let's talk about Road Dog, man. It's a big movement out here on the West Coast. Right, right. How did you come about creating Road Dogs? Well, man, that's just a long story, man. This goes way back, man. I got put on to Road Dogs, and then from putting on to Road Dogs, as anybody just everybody puts on entertainment, oh yeah, but. It ain't shit till you invest in it. You feel me? It ain't nothing till you start putting in work. So we were just like anybody. Just, hey, Road Dog Entertainment. Woo, woo, hey, we coming up. But that ain't nothing. I took that shit to another level. You feel me? I started putting money behind it, uh, watching people like you putting work into the, uh, the the shirt industry and clothing. I started knowing that it ain't just about music. I started investing in, in, in my silk screening and started investing in editing videos and stuff of that nature. So before you know it, years pass by, I look back, and it's all history now, you know? You turn around, and, and you keep being persistent and keep working. Before you know it, you turn around, and all you have created is history. So years pass by, and I found myself working with the best in the industry, uh, uh, recruiting new artists across the world, from here to Russia, Italy, Finland, Netherlands, Mexico. And for me to be living in Inglewood and be able to connect people outside of the world, it just it gives me a different vibe and perspective of this whole industry, you know? Now, how does it make you feel when you got to cut somebody off the team? Man, ain't no... If I put in work, that's a good question, man, because I'm sure everybody has to deal with this fucking bullshit, right? But if I put in work for any gang, any hood, any industry, any job, anything, you can't kick me out. Why? Because I put in work. You cannot... I know I fucked up or whatever. You got to fix it. You can't kick me out. I got love for this. So anybody that's ever got kicked out or anything, it ain't because of me. I'm a nice guy. I give people opportunities. So you know damn well they must have done something bad. You feel me? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I'm always going to provide. I'm going to give for them more than they're going to give to me. You know? So how does it feel? It feels fucked up. Why? Because at the end of the day, I want to create a family. I don't want to create just people that you recruit and hey, hey, get them a job. No, I want to create a family atmosphere where if this motherfucker has resources to be a mechanic, well, then I got a mechanic for life. If this guy knows how to do this, well, we're friends for life. That's why big old colleges and friends that have sororities and all that, and they're friends for life. That's what I'm trying yeah. to do, you know? So how does it feel? It feels fucked up. But then again, if you weren't made for this, if you ain't cut for this type of life, if you ain't loyal, then you ain't, you, you're not going to reach to the next level. You, you can't reap the benefits, you know? So as you invested in the road dogs and your career and everything, What's the limit of your investment? Do you got a set limit, or you just invest all? I when you right now, it, it, it's time for perspective. It, it sit back and, and look at things differently and go at a different angle because I've been going at one same angle. But if I sit back and look at it, there is no limit. You know why? Because I just uh, got me forty eight hats. Man, that's an investment. That's another seven hundred. You know, but because I love what I do and I make money, it doesn't hurt me. As long as you have a revenue of something making you money, then that's it's gonna equal out. But if you putting in too much and not bringing in too much, then you, I don't got kids, so it ain't gonna hurt my kids or my you know my dogs. But to some people, it might hurt them, and maybe that's one of my advantages, you know. Yeah. So when do you call it quits? So let's say you put in money into something, but it's not getting no return. Mm -hmm. Do you stop and take an L and move on, or you don't keep on feeding it? I just don't keep on feeding it as much. I just keep it surviving. You know what I'm saying? This whole industry, as we know, is smoke and mirrors. And I have a lot of smoke and a whole lot of mirrors. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so at the end of the day, as long as we keep that shit running, well, as an entrepreneur, there's always going to be another avenue, another thing, not, not, something else coming in. So when you start with the shirt, if that ain't going to work, then you go to another angle. You know what I'm saying? So let's talk about Mr. Everywhere. Mm. Why don't you have any kids, man? You can't produce? <laughs> I could produce, bro. I could <laughs> produce. It's just that I found myself, and I sat back and thought about that. I found myself being in foster homes all my life. My dad shot at eight. Me watching everybody in the hood, having kids, like, for fun. Why? Hey, I'm going to have a kid. Why? Because I'm going to put uh, in welfare. That's really what's the lifestyle all around me. You feel me? Mm -hmm. About in Mexicans, we about nine, ten, eleven, twelve deep in a one bedroom apartment. And I refuse to be the same type of person and, and fit in that stereotype. So when I find myself a little bit older, twenty four, getting my shit together, I realize that you don't need to have kids and you don't need to have this other I'd rather be alone than be with a bad partner, you know? Yeah. And and as far as having kids, why bring in somebody into this world not planned? Everything in my life is planned literally planned to the T. 
So when I have a kid, I replanted. It. It's around 35. Around 35, a bitch can't go nowhere. She's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, you run into OG Rome yeah. at 35, you better watch out. <laughs> That's the age. So, so, as being raised in the foster system, hey, you, so you never got adopted to a family, or did you wash out nah. at 18? So, I, I washed out at 18. Then from 18, I, I was in 13 foster homes, back and forth that I recall. Uh, and then I ended up living with my sister, and then my little brother was still in foster homes. So... I did something stupid and told my, my social worker that I wanted to go back to the foster homes instead of my family just so I could go in Palmdale and back him up because he was having some problem with some gangsters up there. So I went to go back him up and on the first month he gets locked up. So I left my whole family to go back to foster homes for him to get locked up and for me to be stuck by myself, you feel me? The only reason I got in that foster home was because the person that got a vacant um, bedroom just got in a, a fire... Uh, 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 a fire gun pursuit at the 7-Eleven around the liquor store. So when he got arrested, I was able to take that bed. But yeah, man, that's a little bit of my background, man. Well, do they teach you anything how to survive once they Actually, they do. They do. So when I graduated eight, uh, from foster home to 18, I entered the transitional living program. And, and what that does is for people like me that don't know how to get a job and don't know how to survive and don't have no clothing and no refrigerator, they, they get you an apartment. They get you a, a bed, a refrigerator, everything, and they get you a job. Now it's up for you to maintain. And then your rent is cheap as fuck, like two, three hundred dollars. And then before you know it, after you finish the whole program after a year, whatever you put into it, if it was fifty thousand dollars, ten thousand, eleven, all that gets back to you. Oh, that's that's yeah, sweet, yeah. Man. So as an adult male, do you ever wish you could change your childhood and be a, a together family? Damn, man. Everybody wants that, right? But then again, if you look at TV, man, even the people that have it all, they have issues. There's always an issue regardless of what it is. Even if a mom gives everything or a father gives everything to the kid, then the kid comes out bad. It's either one. You're going to work all day or, or stay home all day. It's going to give or take either one way or another. So me, actually, I wouldn't change a damn thing because I probably would have been solved would have been uh, uh, easy to manipulate it. And me going through the struggles and everything is actually what makes me who I am. Why? Because when I head forward and I see a situation coming towards me, like violence, cops, and all that, I ain't worried. I, I don't shake. I don't get nervous. Nothing. Why? Because I've been through it so many times that I, I know exactly how to dodge the bush. You feel me? While other people are just going to go ahead first and just fucking don't know how to take care of the situation. So I wouldn't change a thing, man. It so, is what it is. So how is it being Hispanic man in L.A.? Hispanic in L.A.? Stereotypical. As soon as I, well, especially in the industry, you feel me? I love it though. I like it though. So, cause I get off stage and I get this off the, oh shit, man! I thought you was gonna do some of that gangster shit, that gangster Mexican rap, man. You fucking dope. And I'm like, though, I just laugh on the inside because, regardless, I'm that southern Mex, um, that southern California Mexican, which means tattoos and bald. You yeah. feel me? So no matter, I can't run away with it. I can't. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? But my music is a little more mainstream, a little more, you know, turned up. So I love it when they assume I'm going to be away with that gangster shit. And then I just, you know, flip so, it on them. So I seen a video, I think you posted, that you being harassed with the police in Mexico. Oh, oh what shit. That situation, man? Oh, man. Every time I go to Mexico, bro, it's like they know I'm about to go pay them. Because they pull me over. I have to pay them. It's like I, I'm not even nervous no more. I know that they're crooked, <laughs> that I bribed the fucking cops. And, and without being scared, the first time I was scared, but so what happened is I was doing a music video called Mexican. So I did a song called Mexican, talking shit about Donald Trump. So I'm like, you know what? Let me do something different. Let me go to Mexico and film this shit. Watch the people actually go through the struggles. The little kids, two, three years old, up at four or five in the morning, telling chiclets for one cent, five yeah. cents. I was capturing all that. Last day, I'm crossing the border. I'm like, fuck it. Let me go to the actual border and start filming. I start filming. All these gangsters and everything start coming out these dirty ass apartments because I went through some apartments to jump the gate to jump over the border. And it's like one border and then the American border. So it's just fucking ghetto. And I'm out there making noise and everything and all these people start coming out. Then here comes the popo. Boom. And the popo comes with like four or five people on the back of the truck with M16s, big old straps. And then they're like, come here, come here. I throw away my weed. Bam. Luckily, I didn't get caught because they don't accept bullshit. And they're like, where you from? Woo-woo. 
I tell them, hey, man, I'm out here doing music, this and this and that. They're like, you know where you're at? And I'm like, no, I'm just teaching. I'm about to go home. They're like, look around. All those motherfuckers are from the cartel. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they shoot at us. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you shouldn't be here. And it's funny because a grip of fools. So what he told me is that all the people that get deported from America and that can't go back to TJ, they're all in these little apartments and everything by the border. And I was literally right there because I love gutter spots. So yeah, yeah, keep it authentic. Yeah, and so I was filming there, and luckily I got away. I didn't get blasted. I didn't get robbed or nothing, you know? God bless him, man. So what is your ultimate goal for Road Dog Entertainment? Ultimate goal, to be able to provide opportunities for young upcoming artists. At the end of the day, I already done my part. I'm going to keep doing my part. I'm going to get mine. I'm going to be fine. Why? Because I, I, I know I, I broke I broke the code. It's simple. You know what I'm saying? Just fucking do it. And if they don't do it, just work on yourself. And eventually, they're going to get mad because they know they should have been working with you. So yeah, it's exactly. simple. You know what exactly. I'm saying? Uh, but uh, my goal is just to be able to provide services, man, opportunities. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It don't always have to be right there in front of them. But at least if I have bait, then they have my whole team has something to fish with. You know what I'm saying? So how, how did it feel when you actually won the Hoodie Award, man? Because I know years prior they slept on us, but you actually got recognized. Man, well, it feels good, bro. What should I call it? Uh, yeah, it, people do overlook people, but at the end of the day, you can't get mad at them because at the end of the day, they're independently trying to uh, acknowledge others, you know? So sometimes you get overlooked, and sometimes and it's not the intention to get overlooked. You know, they're just busy. So it's your job to make sure you be like, hey, motherfucker, you just overlook me. Here I am. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's back. it comes back to normal. Now, if you ain't got no product or you ain't got nothing to offer, then don't even say, hey, bitch, you, you overlooked me. Exactly. Nah, it was purpose. You ain't doing nothing. Get the fuck out the way. Let us keep going forward. You feel me? So what was your biggest mistake so far in your career, man? Biggest mistakes. Let's uh, talk about your music career. What's your biggest mistake in your music career? In my music career expecting and relying on people you know what i'm saying when you expect that uh you got this famous feature and because of that something's gonna come out of it or they're gonna help you out or relying on either your own members or anybody that even you really trust to do it for you at the end of the day this is your dream your goals and your vision you sit it down you lead by example can't nobody give a fuck about your shit more than you. Even your closest right hand man, just double check on it. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, everybody got life, they got kids, they got things to do. And they're just supporting either me or the movement. But at the end of the day, it's my vision, my thing. I just got to supervise everything, you know? As your team, man, do you feed, do you pay your team or are you pay them with opportunities? So everybody, like for this uh, on Tuesday, so it's all about hustle. This whole thing is about a hustle. Either you, you have... I can only put you up for the opportunity, but if you have something for me to make money off of you, if you're a producer, you got something that I could use. If you're a filmer, you got something I could use. As long as you have something that I could use to sell, then I could sell it. So for like this Tuesday, I just booked the whole team that sets up and got everybody paid. I get paid to perform, but everybody on the flyer, they're all learning how to get paid. Um, my Every one of my promoters, they get 20% out of booking me. Dazer, shout out to Dazer Dab, shout out to Bruno, shout out to Faye. Faye was the first motherfucker that, that, that was booking me left to right, you feel me? Exactly. But Dazer is the last one that's been booking me, so he gets his fucking 20%. And at the same time, ask the team. I don't need no money. So sometimes it's, it's theirs. Why? Because it feels good to be able to feed them. Why? Because they ain't been through what I've been through. I know sometimes you get some and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you barter. Sometimes you just take care of the opportunity. To them... Just a little bit of something, I'm like, damn, that feels good. I'm like, well, that's what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? Official, man. So what projects are you currently working on right now, man? So I found myself, uh, my computer breaking down last year. So it broke down. I was off from recording about eight, nine months, and I just got me a new one. So since November to right now, uh, February, I knocked out around 72 new songs. I'm talking about songs that I, every song that I had in my computer, Kicking up dust, I recorded to, and everything. So I got about three or four new albums coming out. And as of two days ago, I got with my team to come up with names for my new album. And since the last one was called Strictly Business, I'm trying to make and you know everything about Road Dogs is business. So I'm trying to make my next album from here to the I die uh, 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 a style where everything says business. So last one was Strictly Business. 
Uh, this one's uh, I'm trying to say uh, un un unfinished business, back to business, you know, stuff like that of that nature. So, so something like the Nipsey Hustle Marathon. Like yeah, the, just like that. Everything with business, you know, fam. And, and I already have enough songs recorded where I, I'll be able to just put them in the slots. You feel me? So let's talk about the um, time you've been in jail, man. Been in jail. That's just funny though. Well, growing up, all the little minor shit, selling weed and all that. But as I was telling you on the break, as an adult, I never found myself saying, hey, I'm going to make a mistake because I'm too damn clever. I already grew up from the dumb shit. So I found myself going to the Homie Cocaine's uh, album release party all the way in Upland. So I took off and he had the, what was the name of the album? Uh, Jimmy no, no, no. That before that one is shut, shut the fuck up uh, and cut and cut the, and cut the check. check. Yeah, and uh, we was out there fucking having the best time on stage with all the famous celebrity homies that he got, and then we was done. We was drinking on the motherfucking Hennessy and everything, and luckily I had ate a little Jack in a box. But I'm driving all the way from Upland back to Inglewood, and I'm smashing. I'm talking about I love to smash when I'm after the advance about 100 miles an hour. Woo! And here comes, there was a cop on the right side, and I knew I passed it up. So I'm like, let me slow down. I started slowing down, but I still had the blunt lit. And then they got behind me. I'm like, okay, let's just relax and keep riding. They got behind me. I'm like, fuck. I still didn't turn off the blunt. I'm like, fuck, I'm going to ride this bitch out. You heard that grind face? <laughs> <laughs> that grind face up. And then uh, uh, they pull me over. I turn off the blunt. Bam. I pull over. I'm like, fuck, I feel good. I'm good. And they, they do the whole fucking test, the, uh, the walking test, the fucking finger test. And then I told them, maybe I was too cocky. I told them, hey, I don't want to be rude or nothing, but I drank way early. Because they asked me. I was being on, I drank earlier, but I'm not drunk and I'm not buzzed. And to be exact, I play sports all my life. So when it comes to balance and everything, I'm going to be good. I, and I'm not sure if it worked against me. I found myself getting taken off the road. I had to call the homie Fade. So they tried to get me for a DUI, but I, I blew a 0 0.04, you feel me? Found myself in L.A. County Jail on some bullshit. Then I realized, when you look it up, that they could take you out of the road. You don't have to be a 0 0.08. They could just take you out of the road and lock you up for that day. And then, uh, so I, they did that. Went through fucking county jail, through all the process. Little small-ass fucking, uh, uh, fucking uh, uh, sitting benches. Peanut butter and jelly, small fuckers peeing on himself. And uh, it's funny, I just posted uh, some shit and some fool I was locked up with. This this cat does a lot of stuff with celebrities. I don't know how the fuck we both found ourselves in jail that day. Uh, he just commented on my shit and I told him, Do you remember when we were getting taken out of jail? You have to go through like process it. Yeah. One stage, then another stage, and another stage. And on the last stage, they had the sliding gates open, the, uh, 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 the, the jail cell. And some dumbass kept looking outside. Kept looking outside, and the guards say, "Stay inside, stay inside." We about 20, 40 people deep in a big, little small cell with one shitter, so you have to shit in front of people, pee in front of people. And this motherfucker kept going outside, and the the, the fucking uh, ward guy, he, the cop, locked the motherfucking cell, so now we can't breathe. And they had told this motherfucker stop peeping. So as soon as they closed the door on them, this one fucking cat just socked his foot out. We told you, motherfucker. And this one was huge. Just this little right motherfucker there. was little. Popped him right in the jaw. And I told that for you remember that day that motherfucker popped him in the jaw? Like, yeah, man. He goes, we growing up. We ain't got to go through that shit no more. I'm like, yeah, motherfuckers getting popped in the jaw for fucking putting the head out. I think mean, because he actually fucked it up for everybody. Everybody, we can't breathe, man. Yes. <laughs> that shit was crazy. So that's, that's what happened after the homie cocaine's album release party. <laughs> so since we talking about parties, man, how you come up with your yearly compound party? Oh, man? shit, man. So I found myself, you know, always going to everybody else's events. Then I'm like, you know what? Let me try this shit, man. I done supported everybody for the last fucking five years. I have a dope ass house, dope ass team, dope ass shit. Let me see if I could able to reach out to all these outgoing independent artists and celebrities. To me, a lot of the main guys, yeah, they might be known as celebrities, but my celebrity and homies and friends are people like you, you know? You know what I'm saying? People that actually grind and, and, and invest in themselves. So I reached out to people like you. Grind phase and uh, 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 fucking rapping for and and, 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 and uh, Cali Swag District and everybody that I have on my cell phone. You know what I'm saying? I have a lot of fucking famous people. The ones that said they were coming, they came, and the ones that said they they were gonna try, they tried. But I found myself doing it yearly on my birthday, which is July 8th in, in summer. So we have free food, free uh, Mexican food, free soul food, always provided by the homie Papa's Kitchen. Uh, 
We have fucking uh, uh, weed vendors. We got uh, just great opportunities for everybody to mingle and socialize, you know, and, and be able to create opportunities for independent artists. You feel me? And y'all perform. Yeah, and we get to perform. I got my own stage in the back, my own taco stand and everything. Last year we had Kelly Swag District, a uh, uh, badass fucking uh, everybody, man. So it was dope, man. So what made you want to start up the Road Dog Apparel line, man? Apparel? Just watching everybody else and knowing that as an entrepreneur that had to do more than just music. You know, watching the grind faces, watching uh, a lot of these independent uh, uh, people doing the clothing line. I knew that as an artist, as a Latino artist, they might not want to buy your pro your music. They might not want to do this, but I'm going to hit them from a different angle. I'm going to charge to uh, perform on stage. I'm going to uh, uh, sell my music. If that don't work, then I'm going to sell the shirts. If that don't work, I want to go get the tacos. If that don't work, something's going to work. And, and you know what? If you hit them from every angle, at the end, the tacos never fail. <laughs> you motherfuckers going to be drunk and hot. I'm going to take that motherfucking money. <laughs> so, so what make you wake up one day and start the Raw Dog podcast? Podcast? Well, just the same thing, to know that I have all these connections, and at the end of the day, my vision is to, at the doghouse, we have uh, 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 the clothing line, we got the front office, we got the recording session in the interview room. So I'm, I'm like, you know what, let's, let's, a lot of these celebrity people that I know ain't never took a fucking photo shoot, man. These motherfuckers are known than a motherfucker, but have the same picture on the same flyer for the last 20 years. <laughs> and, and you know you know who I'm talking about? It's mostly everybody. So I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to bring them in as my friends and bring them in for an interview on the house. Bam. And through the interview, we're going to give them a free photo shoot because they need it. Second of all, with that photo shoot, they're going to wear my gear. Bam. They get that done. That's killing two birds with one stone. And while they add it and I bring them into the studio... Then they can hear the music and they know they're gonna love it. So now we got them in for a feature. And while we're interviewing, interviewing them, I, I want to be able to have the independent artists understand how it is that they do their music. They could be so influential by just telling everybody, "Hey, that one song I did with Corrupt or, or with DMX, woo woo. This is how I wrote the 16 and what I was thinking at the time, and woo woo." And now people are not only just tuning into a, a, a interview thing, but they're actually waiting to that part where they can actually grasp information exactly. and, and take it to the next level. You know? Exactly, man. So I uh, should be talking about that. How do you recruit members? Recruit members, man. So I I, I already have people that I I see online that I. I'm interested on, but being interested on and seeing people's talent ain't gonna get me nowhere. You know what I'm saying? I gotta see their grind. You feel me? I, I the the dopest artists on the world are the most fucking laziest motherfuckers in this world because they expect shit to happen. They expect shit to fall in their lap, and that's not not how it works. You feel me? So for instance, shout out to one of the homies in Canada, uh, uh, Dollar Got Beats. I just recruited him. Um, he had gave me a beat a couple months ago. I checked out his stuff, and then I'm like, you know what? If he keeps grinding, if he keeps producing, if he keeps bringing out stuff, then I know that he's about his business. Because at the end of the day, I need leaders. I'm not going to sit. You ain't going to rely on me. I need leaders. I need built leaders. So whenever I'm gone or I'm died, I could just give you the motherfucking keys to the game and take it to another level. So when it comes to recruiting, I just check them out and make sure that in three months since I met them, they still producing. You know, and if he's producing in Canada all the way out here, if my people in Russia and, and, and Italy and Mexico can catch the attention of people in America, imagine if they lived at the doghouse. It would be game over. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I recruit by inboxing them, letting them know, sending all the sites and all of our accomplishments. And then if they're interested, then I put them on a three-month probation. And just like any, this is some insights. You feel me? There's book clubs. There's car clubs. There's everything. This is some real game for you motherfuckers. Everybody puts in $10, $15, $20 a month. $50, $100 a month. And at the end of the day, the lowrider gets fixed. One person's lowrider gets fixed. Well, for us, you motherfuckers smoke more than $50 a weed. You smoke and drink more than $50 of drinks. All, and I put a real minimal for my team. So when they recruit and they sign the contract, they have to invest $50 a month. Not to me, not to the camp. To their motherfucking selves. So I analyze what they do and don't have, and we'll start off with business cards. You ain't got business cards? I ain't going to make your fucking business cards. I'll grab the graphic designer to do it for you on the house because we're all team members. But you're going to pay for your graphic um, business cards next month. You're going to pay for your fucking flyers. And if you can't keep up or doing shit for yourself, you can't fuck with me. You know what I'm saying? So that's the kind of things that I try to do, man. Minimal 50. If I really, like, 
if we were big old fucking cash money or nothing, something, man, it's five hundred thousand a month investment. Yeah. Why? Because we need big shit. The thing is, back in the days, we used to invest more, but over the years, 12, 13 years, I found myself buying everything. I don't need nothing, bro. I got all the camera, all the lenses, all I got everything, bro. I, but then I found myself with all these fucking equipment, and not nobody to use it <laughs> but me. <laughs> Man, that's shit. Real shit, man. I was like, fuck. But you invested in your vision. You see your vision. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So how do you, what's that conversation when you got a member that's not no longer investing? The conversation is, is, is quite simple, man. If they're not investing or they're not producing, you feel me? It, 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 it's, it's one, I find a way to always encourage them. You know what I'm saying? So I haven't found myself in a position that had to let go of somebody because they're not producing. Uh, it has to be with this loyalty or or, or or some shiesty shit, you know? Some people that just leave the right way, that's the best thing. You will never hear nothing. Hey, man, this industry's not for me. Uh, I got kids. And I'm like, well, good, bro. It's all good. You know, support. I got some people that moved up north. Uh, one of the homies who used to do our shirts. Ain't no blood, no foul. We're good, you know? But for the negative motherfuckers, man, it's just negative shit, you know? I ain't gonna say it on, on, on Grind Face TV, but behind that shit, you ain't gonna have another career. You know what I'm saying? This is a small ass circle. You yeah. burn your bridges, there ain't gonna be another bridge built for your ass. You feel me? So you wanna drop that motherfucking name that burned the bridge? Uh, nah, fuck these motherfuckers. Why, why, why are we gonna give names to no namers? You know what I'm saying? Make sure you don't work in this <laughs> <laughs> in the street. Nah, we good, man. Let, these motherfuckers ain't gonna get a penny anyways, man. This, it's all good. It doesn't hurt me. Plus. Any, the thing about me is I teach these people. I, I give them the skills and tools to become better. But as a boss, you don't give them everything. So you motherfuckers didn't graduate my class. You only went to a couple of semesters, so I ain't worried. Yeah. <laughs> they ain't got the whole shit. So how you feel about your team messing with the road dog models? The road dog models, man. So yeah, man. So we started the road dog models for a cool little minute. I recruited uh, six of the America's It Girl competition girls. They so started modeling, doing shit for us. We went to the the Rapid Forte Players Club Mansion party. That's when I introduced my whole road dog models. But little by little, you know what I'm saying? Some of the homies and some of the uh, from the road dogs and the girls find themselves intermingling and just like you know, you don't mix. Business with pleasure, man. You start messing around and then it shit don't work out. They don't want to come to events. They don't want to uh, talk to that person. And before you know it, you know, they don't start showing up. We have to get rid of people, man. So as far as it, man, it's no good for business. It's not good. <laughs> you say no good for business, but how many models you smash? Oh, shit. Me? Man, nothing, man. You know, I'm a professional, so I got to plead the fifth on that one, ground face. You feel me? Uh, shit. The only thing I'm smashing is motherfucking uh, records, man, you know? Other than that, man, I keep it real uh, uh, professional, you feel me? So you say the only thing you smashing is records. Yeah. So how did one of the road dog models became your girl? <laughs> oh, that's some funny shit, man. And right about now, man, I need to call my lawyer, man. You feel me? I ain't going to answer that question, man. Call my lawyer, Grind Face. Call my lawyer, man. Grind Face. <laughs>